On the 24th of October 1954, the ninth and concluding round of the Formula One World Championship was held at the Pedralbe circuit in Spain. In the preceding two years, Spain faced financial constraints that prevented the hosting of the World Championship Grand Prix. However, this year, the requisite funding was secured, allowing the Spanish Grand Prix to make its return to the Formula One calendar, once again taking place on the historic Pedralbe circuit, as it did in 1951. In the aftermath of the Second World War, Lancia aspired to craft a competitive Formula One racing car. To realize this ambition, Lancia enlisted the expertise of Vittorio Giano, renowned for his work with Alfa Romeo and Ferrari. While most designers opted for engines in a straight or inline configuration, Giano chose a V configuration for its compact design. The resulting V8 engine was placed in the D50, making its Grand Prix debut at the 1954 Spanish Grand Prix. This marked Lancia's first foray into Grand Prix racing, and they did so with an entirely new car and concept. Despite being a fresh contender, the D50 proved to be exceptionally capable. The Lancia D50 was a technological marvel, boasting a compact engine design, excellent weight distribution, and superior handling. Unlike many of the F1 cars of the day, which were designed to slide through corners, the D50's low center of gravity, short wheelbase, and ideal weight distribution allowed it to maintain grip. However, if the D50 did lose adhesion, it tended to go into a spin rather than simply sliding. The compact V8 engine of the Lancia D50 was ingeniously placed directly between the wheels. Its shorter length compared to the typical straight six and straight eight engines of the era allowed for a more efficient design. This engine was integrated into the space frame chassis as a stressed member, providing additional structural rigidity. This innovative approach was a precursor to the technologies that would become standard in Formula One during the 1960s, marking a significant advance in racing car design. By positioning the engine at the front and the gearbox at the rear, the Lancia D50 achieved an even weight distribution. The driver was seated between these two components, leaving little space for traditional fuel tanks. To maintain optimal weight distribution, the fuel tanks were innovatively placed in large panniers flanking the driver on either side, while the oil tank was housed in the tail. Unlike conventional designs where fuel tanks were situated behind the rear axle, the D50's layout ensured consistent weight distribution as fuel was consumed during the race. Additionally, the panniers improved airflow by being strategically positioned between the tires on each side. The front suspension featured a tubular double wishbone setup, complemented by a thin transverse leaf spring, with the upper wishbone actuating an inboard telescopic damper. The rear suspension employed a De Dion axle with a transverse leaf spring. This advanced configuration resulted in a lightweight ensemble, weighing just 1,350 pounds, capable of reaching speeds over 185 miles per hour. The DOHC eight-cylinder engine, thanks to the addition of four Solex carburetors, produced an impressive 260 horsepower. Overall, the Lancia D50 stands as an engineering marvel that redefined the possibilities in Formula One racing. Its innovative design, cutting-edge technology, and remarkable performance cement its status as a true legend in automotive history. Facing the Lancia D50 were three formidable Mercedes-Benz cars, two with exposed wheels and one streamlined model. The streamlined version featured all-encompassing bodywork and retained the front inboard brakes coupled by a limited slip device. As per tradition, Daimler-Benz was represented by their steadfast trio of drivers, Juan Manuel Fanjo, Carl Kling and Hans Hermann. Since Monza, Scuderia Ferrari had been engaged in rigorous experimentation and testing, resulting in a modified version of the 553 model for Mike Hawthorne. This updated version featured coil springs for the front suspension, replacing the traditional transverse leaf spring and rubber block, marking it as Ferrari's first car to incorporate coil spring suspension. This time around, the Marinello team was represented by only two drivers, Mike Hawthorne and Maurice Trintignant 
while Jose Froilan Gonzalez was absent due to arm injuries sustained in the RAC Tourist Trophy sports car race. The Maserati team arrived in full strength with their De Dion equipped cars, fielding drivers Moss, Musso, Mantovani, Mieres, and Shell. Meanwhile, the new model unveiled at the Paris Salon was kept as a reserve. In the initial qualifying session featuring the Lancia cars, the exceptional speed and remarkable balance of the Turin vehicles were prominently displayed. Alberto Ascari emerged as the fastest driver, skillfully navigating the intricate corners of the Spanish circuit with precision. His performance secured the pole position for the Lancia team on his first attempt, showcasing the car's advanced engineering and Ascari's adept driving skills. As anticipated, the second Lancia driver, Villoresi, lagged slightly behind his teammate, but still delivered a commendable performance, securing a respectable fifth position. Reigning world champion Juan Manuel Fanjo claimed second place, just one second adrift of Ascari. Fanjo tested both Mercedes configurations, with the open wheel model proving to be the quicker of the two. Mike Hawthorne, in his revamped Ferrari, settled for third, trailing Ascari by two and a half seconds. The most surprising result came with Harry Shell's performance. The American driver claimed fourth place, outpacing even the esteemed Sterling Moss, who ended up sixth in his Maserati. In a bid to test the limits of his updated car, Peter Collins pushed too hard in one of the turns and veered off the track, demolishing his van wall in the process. With no spare car available, the British team's final Grand Prix of the season concluded before it even began. As the drivers lined up on the starting grid for the Grand Prix, Villoresi was noticeably absent. Eventually, the Italian managed to join the grid, but it was evident that something was amiss with his Lancia. The mechanics continued to tinker with the car right up until the very moment the race was about to begin. The drivers face 80 laps on the track, with the entire race spanning 505 kilometers. As the race got underway, Harry Shell made a stellar start, charging into the first corner in the lead and securing the top position for the first time in his career. In contrast, Fanjo and Musso had a rough beginning. Fanjo slotted into sixth place, while Musso fell back to twelfth. Fanjo quickly shifted into attack mode and began clawing back lost ground. The Argentine driver surged past Moss, securing fifth place as he aggressively pursued the front runners. Shell, pushing himself to the limits, aimed to set a blistering pace right from the start. With a light fuel load, he sought to disrupt the competition. However, by lap three, Ascari had overtaken him and began to steadily pull away. The duel between Fanjo and Moss intensifies, with neither driver yielding an inch. Their relentless battle for fifth place provides as much excitement for the spectators as the fight for the lead. Hawthorne makes a bold move, overtaking Shell to claim second place. However, the American is determined not to surrender easily and stays close on Hawthorne's tail. By lap nine, Shell retaliates with a counter-attack and reclaims second place. On the same lap, Moss makes a decisive move, overtaking Fanjo and regaining the upper hand over the world champion. Ascari, having built a commanding 10-second lead over the field, unexpectedly dives into the pits at the end of the lap. After a brief stop and discussions with his mechanics, Alberto re-emerges, now trailing at the back of the pack. As a result, Shell resumes the lead closely followed by Hawthorne and Trintignant. Trintignant launches a determined assault, 
overtaking both Hawthorne and Shell in quick succession to seize the lead of the race. Ascari makes another pit stop, this time for good, as his clutch fails him. Despite showing impressive speed, both Lancia cars are forced to retire from the race, completing just 12 of the 80 laps. Hawthorne makes a slight error, allowing Moss to slip past and take third place. However, Hawthorne quickly recovers and retakes the position from Moss shortly thereafter. Fanjo closes in on the battling pair and successfully moves ahead of Moss, seizing fourth place. Moss starts to lose speed and swiftly drops several positions, falling back to eighth place. The lead was constantly shifting among the top trio. Shell briefly took the lead, then Hawthorne, followed by Shell again. However, the American overstepped and spun out, damaging the tail of his Maserati and slipping to fourth place. Now, two Ferraris have surged to the front, with Fanjo holding on to third place. Shell pulls into the pits with a broken transmission, ending his race and disappointing those who had been impressed by his performance today. Trintignant encounters trouble as his Ferrari emits a worrying grinding noise during gear changes, signaling an oil shortage in the gearbox. At the end of the lap, Maurice heads to the pits for repairs. After a lengthy stop, he returns to the track in last place, effectively ending his hopes for a strong finish. With Trintignant out of contention, Hawthorne now leads the race decisively, holding a commanding 20-second advantage over second-placed Fanjo. On the same lap, Herman experiences an engine misfire, allowing Musso to overtake him and secure third place. Herman continues to fall behind, losing position to Mantovani and dropping to fifth place. He eventually pulls into the pits, where his mechanics replace the spark plugs in his Mercedes. To their dismay, this doesn't resolve the issue, and the engine remains uneven. Suspecting a problem with the injection system, they fit a manual fuel pump to his car before sending him back out. Despite their efforts, the extended stop relegates Herman to the very back of the field, effectively ending his hopes of scoring any points. Trintignant's Ferrari suffers another issue as the gearbox runs out of oil once more. The French driver is forced to return to the pits, and this time he is unable to continue, officially retiring from the race. Mantovani, closing in on Musso for third place, misjudges his braking and veers off onto the bypass road, causing significant damage to the rear axle. Although he manages to rejoin the race, he loses two positions, falling to sixth place. By lap 60, the damage proves too severe, and Mantovani is forced to retire from the race due to further issues with the rear axle. With just 12 laps remaining, Fanjo's Mercedes starts leaking oil, which sprays directly into the cockpit, causing burns to the Argentine's arm and shoulder. The discomfort and engine overheating force Fanjo to slow significantly, allowing Musso to close the gap. By lap 74, Musso overtakes the world champion, claiming second place. Hawthorne, the sole contender to remain unscathed, navigates through the chaos of the race with composure. He crosses the finish line first, securing his second Grand Prix victory of his career. Musso claims second place, trailing over a minute behind Hawthorne, and secures his first Formula One podium due to the misfortunes of his competitors. Despite battling a cockpit full of oil, a burnt arm, and an overheating engine, Fanjo manages to bring his Mercedes home in third. Miras and Kling, though not making a significant impact during the race, finish fourth and fifth respectively, benefiting from their car's reliability to earn valuable points. Juan Manuel Fanjo began the season with victories in the first two Grand Prix for his former Maserati team, 
triumphing despite fierce competition from Ferrari. The arrival of the Silver Arrows at the next race in France solidified his dominance, as the Argentine clinched another win, making his championship victory seem inevitable. Yet Fanjo's journey to his second title was far from straightforward. He fought tooth and nail to secure each of his six wins, with the exception of the Swiss Grand Prix, overcoming fierce rivals at every turn. His secret lay in his extraordinary ability to maintain peak speed while minimizing strain on his car's components. Amidst the widespread unreliability plaguing new Formula One machines, Fanjo's skill proved crucial, allowing him to finish every championship race without falling below fourth place. This season truly showcased Fanjo's remarkable talent, earning him the esteemed title of El Maestro. As the engines cool and the final checkered flags fall, we come to the end of a spectacular 1954 Formula One World Championship. What a season it has been. This year's championship has been a thrilling odyssey, filled with drama, innovation, and unforgettable moments that have defined the very essence of motorsport. We saw Ferrari's aggressive resurgence with their innovative 553 model, and witnessed Lancia's impressive debut with the groundbreaking D50, a car that pushed the boundaries of design and performance. The dramatic rise of the Silver Arrows from Mercedes-Benz further redefined the standards of racing performance. The sheer excitement of wheel-to-wheel -wheel combat, strategic overtakes, and the relentless pursuit of victory kept fans on the edge of their seats throughout the season. As we draw the curtain on this extraordinary season, we want to extend a heartfelt thank you to our dedicated subscribers and viewers. Your unwavering support and enthusiasm fuel our passion for bringing you the very best in motorsport coverage. As we bid farewell to the 1954 championship, let us celebrate the heroes of the track, the innovations that pushed boundaries, and the unforgettable moments that made this season truly special. Here's to the pursuit of speed, the thrill of racing, and to all of you who share in the excitement of Formula One. So, see you on the next lap, fellow petrol heads. Until then, keep it fast, keep it furious, keep it Formula One.